So this is a, I know it's an old joke, I thought I'd put it up there because we're going to be covering memory operations in more detail now. So last time, if you remember, um, we had referred to something called the base address register, which is uh, the R1 uh, from this LDR instruction, the uh, one in square brackets. So that, that's the register that has the actual address that you want to operate on. So it's called the base address register. It can be any one of these values, R0 through R12, the stack pointer, or the link register. So the earlier example was something uh, we call pre-indexing, where you just have the register followed by an offset. And uh, the offset can be 0 or it can be left out. Um, but essentially, it takes that offset, adds it to the base address, and then uh, uses the resulting address for the operation, whether it's a load or a store. Uh, there is two more uh, addressing modes. It's called pre-index with writeback. And uh, the difference here is you put an exclamation uh, at the end of the square brackets. So all that means is take the newly calculated address and store it back into the base address register. So here Rn is representing the base address register. Uh, when you add the offset after the load or store operation, the uh, register will contain the new value with the base address plus the offset. Uh, similarly, there's something called post-indexing, and uh, this actually, uh, you'll see the difference in a minute, but it calculates the address again, uh, followed by an offset, but the offset you specify outside the uh, square brackets, uh, and it stores the calculated uh, address back into, this is similar to pre-index with write back, the only difference is the offset is put outside, and there is no exclamation point. So here's an example. So for example, if uh, this is pre-indexed with write back, so if you do LDR R0 and in square brackets R1 comma immediate value of 2, it adds 2 to R1 and stores it into, uh, stores the value at that address into R0, and then it also updates R1 with R1 the address plus 2. Um, similarly, you can also include uh, barrel shifts in your um, addressing operation. So you can calculate an address using the barrel shifter. Um, chances are it will be a nice even number in power of two. So, um, and you can uh, update the register again this way. So you can do a lot of things in one instruction essentially. It gives you this sort of code uh, optimization code size. Uh, Pre-index, uh, which we've already seen before, uh, is uh, as, you've always, as it's always been, where you just add the offset and uh, you don't write the address back into the base address register. Um, you can also do the shifting here, uh, which we might, may not have seen yet, but uh, it'll do the same thing, but it'll use the calculated value, but it won't write that value back into base address register. Uh, Post-index, as you can see, uh, does the same thing as pre-index with write back, but here you specify the offset outside the square brackets and followed by a column. So um, it should be pretty straightforward. Any questions? Okay. Now the store is the same thing, except now you just got to remember that we're going the other way. So we're actually taking the uh, register value uh, in R0 and storing it at the address uh, that's calculated based on the base address register and the offset. Um, so it's the same thing, it's just going the other way, where you're storing values from the register into that memory location. So here I just put, uh, you can take any program, uh, this is just a main program from a lot of the examples, you'll see pretty similar stuff where they're taking uh, uh, variables and uh, putting it on the stack. But, uh, since I was using pointers in this example, uh, it'll store that value at that address um, based on the stack pointer here. So. 
So the address is on the stack, and so it's using that uh, address to calculate an offset. It's like an array, basically. So, um, any question here? So, it should be pretty straightforward. So it's just showing you the different uh, addressing modes. So here you have uh, pre-indexing with right back. So it's going to take the stack pointer. It's going to take the stack pointer here, uh, subtract four, and then write that back into the stack pointer after storing the value of R2 at that address location. Right. So for loading constants into registers, like uh, especially constants that are really large, um, it'll prefer, uh, the assembler prefers to use a move n um, for whatever reason. So instead of writing LDR R0, uh, this really large number here, um, the assembler for some reason has a tendency to choose uh, a move negative, right? So instead of uh, representing this large constant, it will take the once complement and use that instead. And so it will take a move negative of DC and it will put that into R0. Um, so this is just an interesting optimization that the assembler does. Um, so don't be surprised when you use some constants in your program and you go to the assembly and you don't see it. You're like, what happened? Because it's just doing the negative, right? Um, some of these other instructions that uh, are available are uh, saturate. Uh, so these are all the same uh, addition, subtraction operations, but it tries to saturate based on the bit mask that you provide in the second register. So it, it'll only do it up to that many bits. Essentially, it'll saturate the value up to so many bits that you specify in register two. Um, so what that means is if the value goes above that uh, bit position, then it'll truncate it and essentially just put the max value that can be represented in those many number of bits specified in register two. And uh, the add does the same thing, except it saturates the result of the addition. The subtraction does the same thing, except it saturates the result of the subtraction. Um, QT, uh, QD add is interesting because it takes the double and then adds and then takes the saturation of that, you know, and puts it into a register one. So, <coughs> and QD subtract does the same thing. It's just doing doubling the uh, third register, subtracting it from the second, and then saturating that value, putting it into uh, register one. So uh, back to control flow. So we had seen uh, how the branch operates earlier, uh, where if you say branch label, it actually stores the address of that target label into PC and then branches. Uh, BL, BLX, and BLX do an additional uh, operation where they take the um, program counter, save it into the link register uh, before doing the branch. Right? And uh, CBZ, CBNZ are used for conditional operations, but um, I just wanted to go a little bit more into detail on how these uh, conditional operations work. So, So most of the instructions in the ARM instruction set can be made conditional. So if you wanted to do a conditional add or a subtract, you could do that. Uh, you would just use a uh, prefix uh, or a suffix, sorry. Um, and you can look up a mnemonic, actually, from the table that follows. Uh, you can look up a mnemonic, actually, from the table that follows. Uh, and this actually is. Uh, a performance, uh, it's, it's uh, meant to optimize performance because you can actually do branch prediction and things like that much better if you have the conditions. So this actually helps in that regard, which is why uh, they have these conditional suffixes. So you already know equals, not equals. Uh, there's also CSHC, which is uh, unsigned, higher or same. It, checks for the carry flag, um, high carry or lower order carry, where the C is zero or one. Um, so you can 
You can branch based on whether the carry bit is set. And you can also do uh, minus where it's negative. Um, this is usually never used. You usually use equals, not equals, greater than, less than, greater than, or equals, less than, or equals. Um, but these are the sort of flags that are checked. And it's just using the flags from the current program status register to ensure whether the conditions met or not. And AL is almost never used because it's kind of pointless. Um, always just save the instruction that you want to do, just add or subtract without. Um, but they do have that mnemonic in there. So this was just, again, a reference to the CPSR flags. So now I'll talk a little bit about pipelining. So if you remember, we have three pieces to the instruction cycle. One was the fetch, where it fetches the instruction. Then the second one was decode, where it decodes the instruction, figures out what to do. And finally, it executes it. So the, the important thing to remember about pipelining is that it does not uh, improve your instruction execution, instruction execution time. It just increases the throughput of your code. So more instructions can be executed um, in parallel as opposed to taking time to fetch and decode, right? So here's an example. So if you had a bunch of operations where you have add, subtract, or, bitwise or, and, or, and then exclusive or, what it's going to do is it's going to uh, fetch, decode, and then execute the first instruction for add. But while it's decoding the add uh, instruction, it's also simultaneously going to start fetching the next instruction. And while it's executing the add instruction, it actually starts decoding the second ins instruction. And then finally, uh, when you have or, it's uh, by the time you're executing the first instruction, it's already fetching the third one. Um, so this is sort of why I had mentioned earlier that the program counter is always pointing two instructions ahead, is because the execution is actually happening um, two steps ahead. Does this make sense? So in thumb mode, it's going to be plus four bytes, because it's, uh, each instruction takes up two bytes. And for ARM mode, it's going to be plus eight bytes, because it's going to take up four bytes each for each instruction. So there's also problems associated with this. So what happens when there's a branch? And especially if it's a conditional branch, right? So uh, a conditional branch actually helps in this regard because it actually reduces the number of branches that are possible. And it helps the branch predictor, which is actually part of uh, hardware implementation on ARM. Uh, to reduce the number of branches, and therefore it can pipeline more amount of code and get more throughput. So every time you do a branch to a fresh location, you just say branch to this address, uh, it has to flush the pipeline. So if you can reduce the number of branches, it's going to reduce the number of flushes in the pipeline, and therefore you're going to get more throughput. So instructions, again, are uh, dependent heavily in this case uh, on the previous instructions. Um, so there's this is called data dependency. Um, and what happens if there are interrupts in the middle of the pipeline? I'll talk a little bit more about interrupts um, later. But interrupts are literally what um, interrupt your program flow, right? And then start executing some other piece of code. So when an interrupt occurs, whether it's in the beginning, middle, or end of a cycle, right? It's going to finish whatever it started. The, the, if it's executing an instruction, it finishes that. And then it flushes the pipeline and jumps to the interrupt. Does that make sense? So we're going to see this a little bit later. Um, so how the code is actually optimized uh, is very heavily dependent on the actual implementation of the ARM chip on the hardware. Uh, so it's dependent on the processor. It's dependent on the compiler. Is data dependency visible to the assembly language programmer? Uh, no, but it's uh, 
it's available to the program design, right? So the, the person who's writing the code right. can write their code in such a way that it's pipeline friendly. So, so the so does the decode phase care about the contents of, of things? Like if you're using R2 as a base register, yep. does the decode phase care what's in R2 or just that you specified R2? I think it's going to. You know, the currently executing one is going to change R2. Two, the current right. executing is going to change R2. Two, right. does, it, does the decode phase of the next instruction, does it, you know, does it care what's in R2 at that point, or is it going to wait until it, until it executes and then care about what's in R2? That's a good question. Um, I believe it's going to uh, not care about R2. So uh, ARM chip doesn't have uh, hardware intelligence, I guess, if you will, to figure that out. So we have to be careful when we're pipelining also. To make sure, you know, and that's the reason I brought interrupts, right? So, mm -hmm. so interrupts is a good example where you have changed the values in the register. Interrupt occurs, some other piece of code starts running, but what happens to the values in R2? So I'll go to a little bit more detail on interrupts later. Um, but that's a very good question. But if you're writing an application level program, you know, interrupts are somebody else's problem. Probably, <laughs> right, right. You, want make, you want to make sure that, that you're not. You know, when you're, you're in certain sequences, you're not messing things up. That's why I was just wondering if it's for an application level programmer. Right. I believe it, 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 it compromises data safety, if you will, right? So hmm. You can't be sure of what uh, what value is in that register. That's why we have to kind of do, we have synchronization deadlock problems still, you know, even on ARM. So, um, so yep. So I hope that sort of answers, but I'll have to look into more detail on how the on part does that. So, but most of the time, that's why it's very dependent on the processor. It's dependent on the compiler, so um, things can change uh, depending on how the implementation is defined. And a lot of the ARM manuals you'll see is uh, they actually use implementation defined as sort of a throwaway to say, just check with the vendors. Um, so other ways of branching, uh, we had looked at uh, the branch instructions, but there's also other ways we can do it. Uh, you saw a pop, popping, uh, popping a value from the stack into PC also does a branch. Uh, you can also, so any, anytime you basically write to the PC, um, it causes a branch to occur. So here you can do LDR with the PC, PC and an offset, so you can jump to a value. Uh, again, this will flush the pipeline, and so it'll start over from the new offset that you've given. Um, and the value written has to be aligned for the mode that it's in. So if you're in thumb mode, you know, that address has to be aligned uh, to uh, half words versus arm mode where it has to be aligned for um, uh, full, full words, 32 bits. So earlier processors actually used to have a prefetch. Um, and this is sort of the reason why they st stuck with the convention. So ARM ver version 4 and earlier, the program counter always pointed two instructions ahead for the reason of implementing uh, pipelining. And so even to this day, they've continued with that sort of uh, convention, if you will. And I just thought I'd put that in there. Um, yes. So here's an example. So where do you guys think um, after it's executing the instruction that's been highlighted, where do you think the next instruction to be executed will be? Yep, that's right. It's going to be this guy right here. Uh, this guy right here is going to be the next instruction to be executed. So let's look at why. So the PC at this point is pointing to two instructions ahead, right, when it's executing this guy. But uh, it's going to say load LDR PC, PC plus 4. So PC is actually pointing here, right? So it's going to say take the memory contents of the program counter, which is this guy, add 4, which is this guy, right? And load that uh, address's contents into PC, which is, so it loads this address into PC and causes a branch to this target. Does that make sense? So this is the uh, 
this is sort of like if you had a lookup table for jump targets, right? You could use this sort of, uh, and we'll see this being used in uh, something called the interrupt vector table. So when you uh, when you wire your interrupts to say this is the code I want you to run, you'll see a bunch of these instructions: LDR PC PC hundred, you know, um, and you'll see that later. So. This is very important. Uh, so now we come to the one, or actually two instructions to rule them all. Um, so we have LDM and STM actually stand for load multiple, store multiple. And this allows you to do consecutive uh, memory and register accesses. Um, so you can load a lot of things in one instruction, again, for code size. Right? Um, it's actually also optimized because uh, if you use these, uh, you can tell the cache, the TLB cache that sits in between the memory and your processor, hey, you know, I'm going to do consecutive accesses. Why don't you just start caching all these values? You know, and so then it doesn't have to go to the DRAM. It can just go to the cache, pick up those values, and start using them right away. So it's actually a performance optimization again. Um, so this is how load multiple and store multiples work. So um, load multiples have uh, different modes. So you can say start at one address, go up to this address by uh, you know incrementing by four every time, or you can say start at the top, go down below uh, four at a time. You know, so so increment after decrement after are. Uh, uh, two uh, different modes, essentially. So if you use LDMIA, you can't use STMDA, um, and vice versa. So the start addresses and the end addresses differ a lot So uh, between these four. But there are mnemonics that ARM provides. For example, for doing stack operations, uh, you would use uh, LDMFD and STMFD. What that means is, it knows the mode that the stack operates in, right? And so it's going to use this to mean LDM IA when you're doing LDMFD and STM DB when you're using STMFD. So we'll look at an example of this. So earlier, uh, we were using push and pop instructions for the stack. Um, but now we're going to start using the LDM and STM instructions to do the same thing. So generally, stacks are uh, either ascending stacks or descending stacks. So uh, generally, it's usually a, a descending stack where the stack grows to lower memory addresses from a higher memory address. Um, and so this is why uh, the most common two instructions that you'll probably use are going to be LM LDMFD and STMFD. And those are just mnemonics for LDMIA and STMDB. So these are the pairs that you would use. Uh, so you can use uh, these two are actually descending stacks, and uh, these two are for incrementing stacks. But it's just a matter of where the stack pointer starts, whether it starts on an empty space or a filled up space. So um, let's look at one, one of the examples here. So we have STMDB. So this would be the same as writing STMFD. But now what you're trying to say is stack pointer. And here's an um, example of pre-index with writeback. So you're at, this is actually special. You, you say after you've used the stack pointer, update it to the latest value. So it's going to write the, uh, after it stores these registers on the stack, it updates the stack pointer to uh, point to, as you'll see, um, the last value that was written to. So, so our stack pointer starts off pointing to here, 8018. And we have R3, R4, R5, R7 that we want to put onto the stack. So it's going to start off at, if you refer to your uh, table, Again, it's going to start off at uh, x minus 4n, right? That's the start address. So that means it's going to take, there's four, uh, four elements. 
So we're going to take uh, 4 times 4 is 16. And we're going to take uh, 8,018, um, subtract, this is all hex again, uh, subtract 16. And then uh, we're going to start off at 8,008. So we store the first value, which is register of R3. The next uh, it calculates is, uh, and it goes all the way up to x minus 4, which is, so 8,018 means it stops uh, 4 bytes the 4. So R3, R4, R5, R7 get uh, put into uh, the slots above the empty slots. So your stack pointer generally points to an empty slot. If you remember from the push and pop operations, um, it points to the, uh, I'm sorry, the stack pointer points to the top element of the stack. So that's uh, going to be a non-empty space generally. Um, so once you have updated the stack, you want to load it back into the registers, sort of the, uh, in the epilogue. So now the stack pointer, if you remember here, gets updated to 8008, which is uh, the, actually the first element that it started off with. Um, so this is SDMDB. So once we do LDMIA, it's already 8008. It's going to start loading um, the values back from the stack into the registers. And it again stops at 8014 and it puts that into R7. And then the stack pointer gets updated to uh, back to 8018. So when we had the store multiple descending, it actually put the uh, stack pointer at where the uh, first register was stored at. So this is important. So when, if you reference the stack pointer after this instruction, it will point to the first uh, element that was put on the stack, which is at the bottom of the stack. Actually, this is the top of the stack. It's just uh, pointing to 8008. Um, so if you see, this is increasing uh, memory addresses downwards. So the stack is actually going to grow upwards. So we're going to have uh, R7 is actually going to go to the bottom of the stack, and R3 is going to go to the top of the stack. So even though it starts storing them in the reverse order, uh, this is what makes it confusing. So even though it starts storing them from top to bottom of the stack, right, the stack is actually still following the convention of going from bottom to top, because the addresses are decreasing going up. Does that make sense? So that's why uh, they've provided the LDMFD and SDMFD, and that sort of takes care of uh, the addressing for you. And this is just the way that their hardware implements it. So, so we have to be careful when we use the stack pointer after using uh, either of these instructions. So if you don't understand the uh, stack operation yet, don't worry, because uh, I'll we'll get into more details when we cover calling conventions on how the stack works. So. Does the SP get put back to uh, 8018? Yes. So the stack pointer gets updated back to 8018. So generally, what you would do is when the function is called, you want to store some the registers according to calling convention into the stack. And when that happens, you're using STMDB, which is the slide earlier to this. And the stack pointer ends up pointing to the uh, top element of the stack, but the order it puts it in is reverse. And um, so you can still use the stack pointer after this, right? And push more things on, but um, after, after you're done with your method, then you want to put the register values back, and you would use the LDMIA uh, as the mnemonic for loading them back into the registers. Because otherwise, what will happen is if you use uh, STM or LDMDB or LDM, uh, IB, sorry. Um, so it's going to start at one address prior. So it's going to start at 8004 and try to load values back to the register. So you just have to be careful, which is why they sort of give you these mnemonics. So this 
So fully descending is generally for stack operations that are descending. Um, and you could use full ascending if your stack is uh, going towards increasing memory. Um, and so on. So it, here it would be LDM DA and then STM ID. So that's the difference. So here's an example uh, of a function prolog in Epilog, is what it's called. So the prolog actually uh, stores the registers that are going to be messed with in this uh, method at the stack. So you see they're using STM db. And then um, they actually do their work, uh, mess up all the registers, and then they want to load them back. So they use LDMIN uh, to load them back. So when you specify here, uh, they're using link register to store the link register on the stack. And once they're done, they actually put, put it back into PC directly. And so that causes the branch to occur. Right. Application three six two that that wide load that one. What what values what value does PC have there? Is it, P, is it the current instruction plus four or plus eight? Because you've got a wide instruction followed by two narrows. Yeah. So the wide is actually for this guy, this instruction itself. So it's saying the instruction is encoded thirty two bits. Right. Right. And all it's saying is uh, take the value of PC. I'm wondering what, what is the value of PC at that point. So it's going point. to be pointing to this guy. Okay. Um, and it's going to add uh, 52, um, which is going to, so depending on 8366 or 8368 okay. plus 52, um, yeah. which is 8398. Yeah, 52 decimal. Yeah. This is in hex, so you have to convert. But this is actually pointing to uh, the libc library, which is actually located uh, down. So. Actually, this is a jump cable. So it's probably loading the, so it's loading the memory contents up. So it's loading this address. Does that make sense? So it's taking PC plus 52, which is this guy. Um, the memory contents of this. And storing that into R9. Okay. So it's going to store 4D0C into R9. And it, here it's going to store 44F9, um, actually, no, PC plus 528398, which is this value. It's going to look, uh, sto store this value in R9 and I'm guessing this value into R5. That's what it's doing. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm just doing the arithmetic there. Yeah. Okay. To get to get 8398, the, the PC value is 8364, I guess. PC value here is yeah. 8364. Oh. You're just doing the arithmetic, yeah. Yes, that's right. So why is it 8398? So this is on the emulator again. So I'm thinking this is an emulator artifact. But on the actual system. Uh, it would point two instructions ahead. So, okay. I'll have to do that up. I'll get back to you on that. So, actually, that brings up a great point. So, now we can go into switching modes between ARM and thumb. So, when we say ARM mode, everything is 32 bits no matter what. But when we say thumb, it means it's either 16 bits or 32 bits. And you get this sort of mixed assembly that you saw earlier, where you have 32 bit instructions mixed with 16 bit. And uh, generally, all the examples I have here are all in thumb mode. So uh, just keep that in mind. And a processor in thumb mode can enter ARM when it uh, uses any of these branch instructions or the L LDR on the PC. So essentially whenever you're doing a branch, um, depending on uh, depending on uh, what mode that you've set, you know, it can change the uh, mode from thumb and enter ARM and vice versa. Um, if you have a processor in ARM and you want to enter thumb, you can use any of these instructions 
and it switches the mode um, because some of these instructions are only available in 32-bit depending on the encoding that you end up using. So the thumb two instruction set means 16-bit, 32-bit uh, instructions are mixed, but it still means it's running in thumb mode always. The compiler option to actually mix ARM mode and thumb mode instructions, which means have 32-bit instructions as well as uh, 16 and 32 mixed is going to be called mthumb interwork. I'll be honest, I haven't uh, delved too deeply into this interwork, but the default is to turn that option off. Um, and it confuses the heck out of people anyway. So, so how can we tell the difference uh, whether we're in 16-bit uh, um, or 30, uh, whether we're in thumb mode or not. Uh, this was asked by Zeno. So the ATPCS manual, uh, at least for uh, ARM, um, this is also included in your reference manual in the VM. You can look it up. Um, but it, it says that the least, it checks the least significant bit of the actual address. So which makes the address odd, actually, because if it's set, it means the instructions are interpreted as thumb two. And if the bit is not set, that means it's interpreted as arm. Um, so if you want to jump to an address containing a mix of 16 and 32 bit instructions, you want to make sure that you set that least significant bit. And this will become important later on in the hijack lab, uh, where we try and do our own control flow hijack. Um, so just keep that in mind. So how does the processor itself differentiate between thumb mode, uh, in thumb mode, between 16-bit and 32-bit instruction? So the ARM processor is always, it, it's in thumb mode, and it has to figure out how, whether this instruction that I have to interpret is going to be 16 bits long or whether it's going to be 32 bits long. So what it does is, it actually looks at the encoding. So bits 11 through 15 of the, it reads half words at a time. And it checks bits 11 through 15 to see if it's any of the following. And if it is, then it knows that it's the first half word of actually a 32-bit instruction. Otherwise, it interprets it as a 16-bit instruction. So it checks, so the processor is just uh, fetching 16 bits at a time. Uh, it checks the bits 11 through 15 of the half word it's pulled. And if it's any of these values, then it knows there's another half word it needs to complete the instruction. Otherwise, it says, I've got my half word. I'm just going to execute it. So. so now we'll get into the ARM thumb procedure call standard. Uh, this is, uh, again, I would referred to this earlier. It's uh, part of your reference material in your VM. Uh, it's also available on my transfer folder. But the ARM thumb procedure call standard basically defines how subroutines uh, are handled and how they're called and what uh, registers need to be saved and what registers you don't, you don't need to worry about, basically. So um, there's something uh, called caller saved registers where the, the method that's doing the calling of another method uh, has to save some registers because the called method is going to modify those registers. So those are called caller saved registers. So generally, uh, the caller has to save R0 through R3. If you remember, I mentioned that you pass arguments to methods using these registers. R0, R1, R2, R3 are used for argument passing to methods. And so the caller has to save those registers that wants them back. Because R0 for sure, if it has, a, if the calling method, uh, called method has a return value, it's going to be overwritten. Um, and so it needs to save R0 through R3 before calling the method. The callee saved registers are the registers that need to be saved by the function being called. Um, and so in this case, the called subroutine must preserve the contents of R4 through R11. Um, and usually it's saved in the stack. And this is what you see in the function prolog that we saw earlier, the STMDB, LDMIA. You saw some of these registers getting saved to the stack. And uh, it's actually the arm thumb procedure call standard uh, calling convention. So 
uh, the reason R4 through R11 must be saved is because the caller, the, uh, the function doing the calling of the other method, will need those values back once the function is returned. And so if the call, called method um, goes in and changes those, then it has to restore them to the original state before returning to the calling method. Um, so what happens during interrupts? to these registers. Anybody have an idea? Uh, the I know the answer to that. Okay, go for it. Uh, depending on which one it is, there are various numbers of bank registers. So exactly. um, in some of them, it banks most of the registers in some of the banks, just a couple of them. Um, but in particular, it always banks the program counter and the link register. And I don't know about the stack pointer. Yep, yeah. exactly. So uh, we'll co cover this when we get to interrupts. But um, so each mode has its own set of banked registers. And what a banked register means is it has its own memories, uh, um, actual flip-flops, I guess. That's how registers are implemented. So it'll have its own registers that are independent of the mode that you're in. So if user mode has R0 through R11, uh, FIQ has a set of bank registers uh, which go from like R4 through uh, R10 maybe. Um, so it has its own set of registers and those registers are uh, essentially can be used in the new mode without affecting the original mode's registers. Um, so this is the Arthur procedure call standard uh, use for registers. So as I've mentioned, R0, R1, R2, R3 are uh, used for arguments to the uh, called subroutine. Uh, R4 through R11 can be used as variables in the called subroutine. Uh, R12, R13, R14, R15 are special registers. R12 is actually scratch, uh, what you refer to as RSI on x86. Um, but R13, 14, 15. Uh, is our special registers, and um, Galen had mentioned in when it, whenever there's an interrupt or a mode change, you'll have uh, the program counter, uh, link register, stack pointer, and these special registers banked out as well. So you'll be able to write to PC, but uh, actually PC is not going to be banked because it's only one program counter, but uh, only link register and stack pointer are going to be um, banked out. So we'll see that. So just to show you graphically which ones are caller saved and which ones are callee saved, uh, R0 through 3 are caller saved, and R4 through R11 is going to be callee saved. Um, the frame pointer is uh, neither mandated or nor precluded from uh, being used. So uh, it's essentially up to the implementer to decide whether they want to save the frame pointer, which is R11, or not. Um, but the the, uh, the standard doesn't specify you know whether you have to save it or not. Um, usually R4 through R7 is used in uh, thumb mode for your frame pointer. Uh, generally, we've seen R7 being used. If you remember, stack pointer gets saved into R7. Um, otherwise, if you're in R mode, which we haven't seen any examples of yet, uh, R11 would have been used as the frame pointer. It's essentially the stack uh, save of the stack pointer when you start the new method. So what does this uh, look like uh, in action? So you have uh, three methods here uh, that I'll go through. Uh, the main, which calls one, method one. And method one calls zero and two. And then method two just prints uh, a statement. And so, um, so we'll look at how the stacks up. So we're going to have, uh, starting off, we're going to start with the mains frame, right? The main methods frame. And that will actually look like this. So the memory is increasing this way. And actually, the uh, stack should be growing downwards, right? So that's what I'm showing here. So you're going to have, in the main, you're going to have any local variables, which in our case are is uh, nothing. So, look, there's no variables. Uh, but if you did have variables there, this is where they would be saved. 
then you would have the color save registers. Uh, what's the name of those are? It's going to be R0 through R3, right? Because those are going to be used for arguments to the called method, which is going to be one. So, and then you set the arguments to one, um, and you, you call one. So what happens is a branch with link occurs uh, when you call one. So if you look at the assembly code that's generated, it'll actually have a BL or BLX instruction uh, to one. And so the program counter uh, gets updated with a new value to the address of 1. Now uh, ARM is switched over and is now executing at the new program counter. Uh, so the callee saved registers have to be pushed onto the stack because that's the convention. And you use STM uh, fully descending or STMDB, right, which are the same. Uh, and you say stack pointer with registers uh, along with the link register. So generally, the link register also gets saved on the stack. And uh, we will see why this is uh, um, helpful for attackers. Um, so, yes. And once the link register gets saved, then the Kali has its own saved registers that it can put on the stack. Um, which we mentioned up here. Um, so all these registers are going to be in here. So now the stack keeps growing. Uh, we have local variables now in one, if there are any. Let's see. So there is no local variables here. But if you had local variables, that's where they would get saved if you ran out of space with registers. And then um, now there's a call to two if you remember, uh, in one. So since one gets a uh, uh, pulse two, it puts the arguments to two and uh, uh, saves the R0 through R3 if it needs to um, on the stack. And then the branch with link occurs to two now. And so these arguments to two are still on the stack. And now the frame gets updated. So these arrows you can think of as uh, sort of defining the boundaries of the frame. So now the link register will contain the PC of one, uh, but on the stack you still have the link register uh, for uh, method one, which points to main, right? So as you can see, uh, this is very similar to x86. Uh, except that the frame pointer isn't used uh, as heavily. but um, And the stack pointer, as we saw, was being updated using STMFD or LDMFD, uh, which stands for STMDB or LDMIA. And despite the return address being saved in the link register, most often it's put on the stack. And so you can actually write onto the stack. Uh, and if you're able to write to the stack, then you can control the PC in this way. This will help you in the hijack lab. Okay. Just one that in there. So now we'll talk about modes. So as I mentioned earlier, ARM uh, runs in different modes. Uh, we've been talking primarily about the user mode so far, which is where all the <laughs> user land programs run. Um, the other mode that we looked at briefly was the supervisor mode, which is uh, which was activated when we called the SWI, or the software interrupt instruction. Uh, we can also use uh, an SVC, which is also an instruction or that does the same thing. Um, then you have uh, two interrupt modes, which are called FIQ and IRQ. IRQ is a normal interrupt, and, and FIQ is a fast interrupt. Uh, the fast interrupt essentially has more banked registers, so you don't have to waste time saving stuff to the stack like we saw earlier. So you can just start using those registers right away. Um, and so it kind of makes it fast, I guess. Um, hence why it's called fast interrupt. The IRQ has less banked registers, and so uh, it's slower. You have to save all the registers into the stack, then use them, and then restore it. Um, Finally, you have uh, abort uh, and undefined 
and system. Um, so an abort uh, can occur when you have uh, page faults and things like that. Um, or you, uh, the undefined occurs when it accesses an illegal instruction. So it, it, can, it does, the processor doesn't recognize the instruction. So it can go into uh, undefined mode. And um, finally, system is similar to supervisor. Uh, I haven't seen it really being used um, outside of um, you know, supervisor, so. So that's what this page, uh, this slide talks about. So a user is normal program execution mode. Uh, FIQ is used for handling high priority fast interrupts. IRQ is uh, used for handling low priority normal interrupts. Um, supervisor actually is the mode that's entered into when you first reset uh, the power. So when you power on a board, first mode it's going to go into is the supervisor mode. Um, and so, uh, and if you look at the vector table, which I'll talk about more later, uh, the, the way to handle a supervisor mode uh, interrupt is, or supervisor exception mode is to um, run the handler that's located in that interrupt vector table for supervisor. And all that does is, uh, it starts executing a, uh, a specific address. So there's an LDR PC plus some offset, uh, and it just starts executing. And this is why we saw earlier in our uh, U-boot uh, example, right? So it just starts executing the code at a specific address. And that's because there's a interrupt wired up to, uh, for a supervisor that actually tells it to start executing instructions at a specific PC location. Okay, so system again is a privileged mode just like uh, uh, it has the same registers as user mode does uh, and supervisor. So, so this is uh, what the bank registers would look like. So what the bank register does is uh, in user mode we had R0 through R15 followed by the CPSR. Now these new exception modes, uh, like the FIQ interrupt mode and the IRQ interrupt mode, introduce these bank registers, which are physically separate uh, in hardware from these registers. So you can actually start writing stuff in here in this mode without affecting uh, values stored in registers in the user or system mode. That makes sense? And uh, similarly, the IRQ mode has just the stack pointer and the link register uh, that's banked. And supervisor mode does the same thing. So as you saw, uh, in a kernel, I guess, which runs in supervisor mode, you would still need to save these registers because those aren't banked. right? So you need to preserve the user land uh, registers. You can still access user land registers uh, in supervisor mode. And same thing in IRQ mode. You can access these registers too, but except for R8 through R14. Uh, and if you need these registers to, uh, in your FIQ mode, you need to put them on the stack somewhere and tell FIQ mode, this is where my stack is. Go look at these register values that I've saved. So if you remember, the CPSR has a mode uh, section. And uh, so this is what the encoding looks like for that mode in the CPSR. So you can actually see which mode you're in by reading the CPSR. And there are special instructions to do that. You can't use load LDR, uh, STR. Um, I'll go that. So the user is uh, 10,000. Um, actually, this is all binary. So. Um, and the privilege level actually is uh, opposite to what you would think of as rings in x86. So it's actually the higher the uh, number on the privilege level, the more privileged it is. So the hypervisor mode apparently has the highest privilege level, which is PL2. Uh, the monitor mode, which we'll talk about a little bit more, I touched on it briefly, it's called trust zone, uh, where you have this separate area of memory that you can use. That's at privilege level one, and it's actually at the same privilege level as uh, the FIQ, RQ, supervisor, 
only the user mode is uh, PL0. So PL0, this is the lowest uh, privilege level uh, that's available on the ARM. Um, and then I also have on the rightmost column what instructions trigger the switch to these modes. So uh, if there's a, uh, a interrupt that's been wired, um, either via hardware or via software, um, you can you can <coughs> be in either FIQ or IRQ mode. So if you actually have a wired line that's hooked into some pin, and you have a memory I/O register that accesses those pins, um, you can actually set a mask and enable or disable these FIQs and IRQs. Um, so the FIQ, IRQ are most primarily hardware-driven interrupts. Uh, so you can physically interrupt the uh, processor while it's doing some work. Um, the supervisor mode, which we have seen, is uh, enabled by using the SVC or the SWI instruction, which is software interrupt or a supervisor call. Um, if you had trust zone on the uh, on the ARM board, that would be enabled using the SMC, which is secure monitor call um, instruction. So once you say SMC, it either switches to monitor mode or back from uh, it runs monitor code, and the monitor code can decide to run the secure code, or it can decide to switch back. Um, a board is uh, done, uh, happens when you have a data or prefetch abort or misaligned memory access, um, and you can enable or disable these interrupts. Again, um, finally, you have the hypervisor. Uh, the Cortex A15 processor, which has been shipped out to all the vendors, it's still not on mobile phones today, but um, it has uh, hardware extensions for virtualization, uh, and it has large physical address extensions, uh, LPAE. So uh, those chipsets will have the hypervisor mode uh, or hypervisor mode enabled, um, and so it depends on the vendor's implementation again. But uh, there's a call called the HVC, which is the hypervisor call, uh, to enable the hypervisor mode on the processor. Um, finally, you have undefined and system. Undefined occurs when you have an illegal instruction that uh, ARM, the chip can't figure out the opcode is uh, illegal or something. So um, it goes into this undefined mode. So again, the mode changing instructions are SVC or SWI for supervisor, SMC for secure monitor call, and HVC for hypervisor. So the primarily, you'll, the ones you'll be seeing are the SVC or the SWI. The IRQ and FIQs are actually uh, enabled using hardware, and you actually set a register with a mask to say whenever this pin goes high, jump into FIQ or IRQ mode. And unfortunately, since we're running the emulator, I can't show that to you on hardware, but um, you'll just have to take my word for it. So uh, if you remember, uh, we had covered the bank mode, uh, banked registers. So an additional register that I did uh, tell you about is the SPSR. So the SPSR is a separate register that's available for each mode. Um, so one mode's SPSR can't be changed by another mode's SPSR. But what essentially happens when you make these uh, calls, like the SVC, uh, or whenever an FIQ interrupt occurs or an IRQ interrupt occurs, the ARM chip automatically puts the contents of the CPSR and saves it into the SPSR. So CPSR stands for Current Program Status Register. SPSR stands for Saved Program Status Register. So all it's going to do is going to copy. It's going to copy your mode, uh, the last mode you were in, your flags, uh, and uh, whether it's ARM mode, thumb mode, all those, and whether IRQs and FIQs are enabled or not, and put those into the SPSR for you. And then it starts executing whatever is in PC. Uh, Whatever is in the uh, interrupt vector table, it starts executing there uh, in that mode. So, 
So when we want to return uh, from our mode back to user mode or back, uh, back to supervisor mode, right, or whatever mode we're cutting from, it's going to be saved in the SPSR. And when we copy the link register uh, back into PC, we can't restore the SPSR at the same time uh, back into CPSR because uh, if you write the SPSR back into CPSR, the mode's going to change and your uh, uh, next instruction is not going to be executed. It actually causes the mode to change and it's going to go back to your intro vector table. So there has to be a way of restoring CPSR as well as the link register back into PC all at the same time. And this is the instruction that actually does that. So if you remember, I said the move S PCLR instruction is special because this S actually stands for the CPSR update. So it copies the link register back into PC from whatever mode you're operating in, as well as simultaneously it copies the SPSR back into the CPSR. So it does those two things uh, all in one instruction. Does that make sense? So this will actually restore the mode you're in and restore the link register or the PC, the program counter that you were in, in that mode that you had left uh, from. And you all remember the software interrupt exception from Hello World that we looked at. So there are some other special instructions, just like move SPCLR. You could also do a sub SPCLR, and it also does the same uh, copying of SPSR back into CPSR while subtracting some offset value from the link register and putting that into the PC. Uh, so this is very useful when you're returning to user or system mode from exception handlers or uh, interrupt modes. So how can we actually write to the CPSR um, if we had to? Um, so you have these two instructions, MSR and MRS. The way I remember it is uh, S is special, R is register. So uh, the, this is the destination, and this is the source. So you're going to move uh, into the special register, which is CPSR in this case. Uh, a value that's stored in the core register, and that can be R0 through R11, right? Uh, and similarly, MRF is the other way around, where you want to take a value in the uh, uh, in the special register and save it to a core register. And so the way you'd use it is MSR, uh, CPSR, and then the register, or MRS, R0, and then the CPSR. So. This is also confusing. If you remember, I said the destination always comes first. So here, you, if you notice, the two have been switched, even though you're only operating on that CPSR. So you get a little confusing. Uh, another register that I haven't covered yet is called a coprocessor register, which is uh, CP15. There's actually CP13, 14, 15. Uh, I won't go, go into that in this class uh, in much detail, but uh, all you need to know is that within uh, these, there's a coprocessor, is it actually a separate processor, I guess, and it has a set of its own registers that control system-wide settings. And this is mostly used when you have multi-processor uh, systems. So you can actually take multiple ARM chips uh, and create some sort of a parallel computer, if you will. Um, and, and essentially, this controls system-wide settings. So if you wanted to enable or disable interrupts across the board, uh, if you wanted to set the endianness, uh, uh, it allows you to do that for data, uh, not for instructions, like I mentioned earlier. Um, and it also, uh, for exceptions, it uh, sets whether you want to handle the exceptions in ARM mode or thumb mode globally across all processors, uh, things like that. And it actually also has the base address for an exception vector table. Um, so I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more. So if you remember, uh, all these exceptions uh, can occur at any point during the um, processor's uh, instruction cycle, right? So 
What this does is the vector table actually has the address to jump to uh, to start executing um, in that new mode. So when it first jumps to that new mode, it looks up the, the PC that it needs to jump to from this exception vector table and then jumps to that um, piece of code and starts executing there. So the SCTLR is actually, uh, there are two default values for this exception vector table. It's generally and most likely always uh, located at 0x0. Zero zero. So um, and if you remember, that's uh, DDR SDRAM from our memory map. Um, and so the exception vector table is always at zero. And you're going to have the first uh, few segments of memory reserved for this exception vector table. Um, and sometimes, though, the other, only other option is uh, hex FFFF0000. Uh, and there's a single bit that changes whether you want the um, exception vector table to be located at the beginning of memory or at this new address, FFFF0000. I don't know why they did it that way, but uh, that's the way ARM has designed it. So, And the, finally, for the Cortex-R profile, and this only applies to the Cortex-R profile, so these CP15 and SCTLR registers will differ across the different profile and different architectures. And so on the Cortex-R profile, if you remember, we had a divide instruction, uh, sign divide and unsigned divide. Uh, there's a bit in the SCTLR that uh, actually sets whether you want to throw an exception uh, when there's a divide by zero or uh, it generates a zero after you divide. Um, and that's available on the Cortex-R profile. There's also an IE. Uh, uh, this is for instruction endianness. And this is also Cortex-R only. And uh, all that says is, uh, the R manual says it's implementation defined, which means TI or whoever is making the board uh, sets that bit and says, my chip is going to use instructions in little ending or big end. And you can do nothing about it. So um, it's a read-only bit, and you can't set it, but it's uh, something that's there for you to use. Um, all right, so I'd like to stop here and ask if there are any questions so far about exceptions, interrupts, 